All right, so if you'll take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter, and we are uh, working our way through a challenging section. And um, anyway, so I, as I was thinking about this message, it reminded me of something from uh, when I took Hebrew, the one year I took Hebrew, which was not enough. I, I can recognize the Hebrew letters, and if somebody tells me what it is, then I'm good. I'm okay. But, you know, it's beyond me, uh, beyond that. However, uh, there was, the way they taught Hebrew uh, at BJ in those days was the first nine or ten weeks of the semester, they were just drilling you on the structure of the language. So you're putting together the whole verb system, learning how the, uh, the you know, the nouns and other things work, and there's, it's it's actually a very logic. It's fairly simple language, except it's got lots of forms. That's the challenge. And of course, it's not cognate with English, which means, like Latin, we've got a lot of Latin words in English. Greek, you got a lot of Greek words in English. So you at least have a glimmer of an idea sometimes of what the, what the vocabulary is. With Hebrew, uh, behemoth, I think, is the only cognate word that comes into English. And uh, maybe there's one or two others. So, uh, so we, you know, you're just totally, it's totally different in that sense. So anyway, they used to say to us, well, and we'd say, well, how, we're just not getting this. And they'd say, well, you're not out of the woods. You know, you're still in the woods. Uh, you, you know, you won't get it until you get out of the woods. And we, well, finally, one guy said, well, when are we going to get out of the woods? The answer was, you'll know. Okay, <laughs> you'll know. When you're out of the woods, you'll know. And within a few weeks... All of a sudden, oh, this makes sense. He said, okay, you're out of the woods. All right, that's how it is. Well, here we are in this passage. We're not out of the woods. <laughs> it's a very complicated passage. It has a lot of challenging parts to it. And it, there's, there's uh, uh, and last week was the hardest one, I'll have to say. This week is another hard one, but it's not quite as hard as last week. So uh, that's where we're at. Uh, one more difficult bit to understand. So first, we're going to read uh, the passage, uh, verse 20 and 21 are, is our text for tonight. And uh, I'm not sure, maybe I should start at 18, because that's where the section starts, and then we'll, we'll sort of uh, get going. And I'm going to talk about, I'm going to review back to those anyway. So let's start at 18, uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. For Christ also died for our sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. All right, so uh, uh, my title is How Baptism Saves You. Now, I, I admit that was intended to be more than a little provocative to stir your interest, and uh, lest anyone thinks that I've lost it theologically, I want you to assure you right up front that the act of baptism does nothing for you in terms of salvation. It will not save you. It will get you wet, but it will not save you. Now, it's important, but it, it, that's not how you get saved. That's not how you come into a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus. All right, now having said that, I want to work through this text and we're going to see uh, what it's saying to us. And here's my proposition. And I think that, um, uh, I'm not sure if it's totally clear to you as we start with it, but we'll get there, and hopefully this will make sense to you at the end of the message. As Noah was brought safely out of death, so the believer is brought safely out of the baptismal grave by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All right, so that may not be plain. You may say, okay, I sort of see something, but I'm not quite sure what he's talking about. Well, hopefully I can make it clear as we work our way through. So the first thing we want to talk about is the logic of the passage. How does this work? So we have the word for in verse 18. 
For Christ also died for sins. Now, that for means it's a reason. It's explaining something. And the reason, or the thing that it's telling us, back in the previous few verses, he says in verse 13, Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of uh, righteousness, you are blessed. Right? So we're supposed to have this perspective towards persecution. It's a blessing. Okay? The suffering is a blessing. Uh, and then he says, don't fear. Uh, sanctify the Lord in your hearts. Put, make him, put him first. And be ready to give an answer. All right? So why? Well, there's a reason given uh, in verse 17. It is better to suffer for doing what is right than what is wrong. And then we get another reason for... Okay, Christ also died for sins once for all. He also suffered, but he didn't remain dead. He rose again. So he won the victory over our suffering. So we can approach that suffering. We can see it as uh, merely a, a speed bump, I suppose, in the, in the road, and, the, uh, and, and to look at it as a, as a blessing that God has brought our way that we can serve him even in spite of the suffering and the difficulties that it might uh, bring. So, uh, so this four is, is giving us a reason for our confidence. Let's see if I've said everything I wanted to say in the notes. I think that's correct. I think I've got through all of that first point. All right, so, that, so we have four. Uh, Christ died. And then, uh, and, and, he, and it talks about his resurrection at the end of verse 18. And then we have the term in which he was made alive in the spirit. So in which, in that resurrected state, he went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison. And we talked about that last week. Now, it was a very challenging passage. We took the position that the spirits in prison were imprisoned angels, basing that on several other passages. And they're somehow connected to the time just before Noah built the ark and the great flood, as the passage says here. It appears we're just making this isn't we're not going to stake our lives on this, but we are making a conclusion because these spirits, these angels, are imprisoned that they were um, uh, imprisoned because of what they did in fomenting the uh, rebellion amongst men that caused God to bring the great flood on the earth in the first place, and so these particular spirits were imprisoned. By God, and there are other passages that speak about angels, not all angels, but these angels in prison somehow, and that Jesus, in which it says, in which, in his resurrection, he proclaimed. So uh, now the, the question is, did he actually go to wherever they're in prison and say, look, I've won the victory? I don't think it, we have to say that. I think simply the fact of the resurrection proclaims to the world of the evil spirits that they have lost and that the Lord Jesus has won. But maybe he did. We don't know. The passage is not clear enough for us to make that kind of assertion. In any case, his resurrection provides the victory. And again, for us, that gives us the sense when we face suffering for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, He's already won the victory. Okay, we don't, I mean, it's not, I mean, we might worry. You might, you might feel pain. I have a low pain threshold. I don't like that. Okay, I don't like the thought of it. But I know that the victory is already won. I don't have to, I don't have to yield because the Lord has already won the victory over the, the, the enemy who attacks the faith. All right, so I don't have to worry. So we have that in which, but notice all right, so we have the in which, and then he goes, uh, let's see, he talks about Noah building the ark, and then he says, look at the middle of verse 20, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. So he's changing the subject here. And this little in which clause, is, Peter has this tendency, I don't know if it, it's, it's something the apostles did. I don't know if it was normal Greek style. But he has these long sentences, and he'll add things in. So here's a clause. You know, he's adding it in. Right, what is he trying to explain here? Well, we're going to talk about this. Uh, the mention of Noah reminds Peter of another picture of victory that corresponds to the story of Noah. So that's what we're talking about here. We're, we're still in this theme of victory, Okay, especially victory 
over uh, over uh, the attacks against the righteous, I guess is the way we want to say it. So we're going to talk about this. Now, the one thing we need to talk about in this passage for the text tonight is the concept of type and anti-type. Okay, so uh, I, I have a little definition of the type in just a moment. We'll explain that. Uh, but what I want to show you is in verse 21, it starts in the, um, in the New American Standard, it starts corresponding to that. And in the King James, it says, the like figure. Okay, so this, that's translating the word antitype. Okay, the Greek word antitupos, antitype, is, is the word there. And it's, this word is used only twice in the New Testament. It's used here, and it's also used in Hebrews 9.24. And we saw it, we actually looked at this verse last Sunday in our eschatology discussion. Hebrews 9.24, For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Now, the, the idea of antitype in Hebrews 9.24 is that there is a true sanctuary in heaven. There's a true temple in heaven. The temple on earth is the antitype. It's modeled after the type, the original that is in heaven. Okay, so that's, that's what that passage is talking about. I have a definition from, uh, actually from a commentary on Leviticus by Dwayne Lindsay about what a type is. And he says it this way, A type may be defined as an exceptional Old Testament reality which was specially ordained by God effectively to prefigure a single New Testament redemptive truth. And he's, he's discussing this in Leviticus it's in the introductory part uh, of his commentary on Leviticus, but he's discussing it with reference to the, the uh, sacrifices that begin the uh, uh, Leviticus. Leviticus 1 through 7 is all about the Old Testament sacrificial system and the different types of sacrifices there were. Uh, I can't quite remember if it's seven or eight different types of sacrifices, but anyway, those seven chapters describe them. And they are the types. Okay, so they are... They are corresponding uh, to the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, the Bible doesn't use the term type, however, uh, or anti-type in describing those uh, sacrifices. It only uses anti-type in these two passages. So, uh, so sometimes interpreters of the Old Testament will find everything becomes a type. People who get real excited about types. Everything becomes a type. And there are certain things you can see a correspondence. I've heard it said that Joseph is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are certain details about his biography. Joseph of the Old Testament, I mean, the son of Jacob. All right, uh, And there's some details in that story that you could say, well, yes, he, you can see a correspondence. And then you'll see other figures. Of course, David is, becomes a type of the Lord Jesus Christ and others like that. And sometimes, I think sometimes people will get a little too excited about types. But anyway, that's the basic idea. There's a pattern and then there's a follow-up. The pattern begins, it's, it's going to picture it ahead of time. And then there's, there's the, the, the bigger truth that comes along later in the New Testament. That's the idea. So, um, so these are the only two. So the tabernacle in the New Testament. The tabernacle and temple are seen as a copy of the true temple in heaven. That's the Hebrews 9 passage. This one says, okay, let's look at the text again. He's describing the flood, all right? And Noah's building this ark in verse 20. And then he says, in which, in that ark, a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, Baptism now saves you. So now, in this one, there is something to do with the flood is the type of which something to do with baptism is the antitype. All right, is that clear enough so far? You follow what I'm saying? There's a pattern here that Peter sees, and he's using this to teach us something about our confidence when we face persecution. That's really what this whole passage is about. You say, okay, well, how are we going to get there? 
All right, well, uh, I, let's identify this. Corresponding to that. Notice the text again. Corresponding to that. Well, that is what's called a relative uh, uh, pronoun. It's a neuter singular. Greek language has genders. Okay, there's neuter, feminine, and masculine. That's the genders of the Greek language. And, uh, and so when, you're, when you have a relative pronoun... It's pointing to something. It has to modify another or a noun or another adjective that has the same gender, number, and case. All right, so the same form. All right, so where is it pointing? Well, we look back in verse 20. The nearest word is water. Corresponding to that, well, water is a neuter singular noun. That could be a candidate. It's actually the closest possible antecedent. So if you go back a little bit further, in which a few, that is H person. So the word in which a few is a relative pronoun and it's feminine, feminine singular. So it's not likely uh, the antecedent. All right? So that isn't pointing to those persons. It's pointing somehow to the water is the idea. All right, so corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. So the word that is pointing to the water, and now he brings in baptism. Baptism, somehow baptism corresponds to the water. Now obviously with a baptism you do it with water. Is that what the correspondence is? Well, we'll see. Now, we have a problem. We know from our theology of the New Testament that baptism, the waters of baptism itself, doesn't save anyone. All right? Uh, and we, we, we get that from the other passages in the Old Testament. So we know that, okay, we're saved by faith alone. There's nothing else. It's not by works of righteousness that we have done. It's not by baptism, which we've had performed uh, upon us. That doesn't bring about our eternal salvation. So, but somehow Peter is seeing a correspondence. Well, let's think about what happened to Noah and his company. So they built an ark, and they got inside that ark. And if you think back to Genesis chapter, uh, let's see, about 6 is where he starts. Maybe is it 9 where the flood comes? I can't remember. But anyway, somewhere in there, you go back into Genesis. We'll just say Genesis. How's that? You go back to Genesis and it says the Lord shut the door. Now they're inside the ark and the rains came and the flood rose and the tops of the mountains were covered and it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, it says according to the uh, scriptures. And the whole world was covered in water according again to Genesis chapter 9. And uh, it appears that the world had a different form in those days because of the way God had created it, and suddenly after the flood, with all that water pressure on the earth, the earth as we know it today was formed, and certain weaker parts of the earth presumably sank, and the water receded, and the pressure pushed the mountains up, and there you go, and somehow that's how the world came to be as we know it today, the shape of the world as we know it today. But in any case, here's Noah floating on the water. And they float on the water, if I recall correctly, I didn't look this up, but if I recall correctly, they floated on the water for about a year before the ark settled on the top of Mount Ararat, okay, according to Genesis. Okay? And eventually they came out of the ark and rejoiced in their salvation. But in the ark, they were brought safely through the water. That's what our text is saying. Here they are, these eight people, Noah and his wife, his three sons and their wives. So that's eight people. They're in the ark along with the animals that God had put in the ark with them. And they were brought safely through the ark, uh, through the waters and uh, were saved from that experience. Now, the waters delivered death and destruction to all the other men on the earth at that time. All right? So they, we could call them, in that sense, the waters of death. But the ark brought them safely through the water. All right, so how does baptism correspond to that? Well, I want you to notice in our text, in the New American, I'm not sure how it's punctuated in the King James, but the New American does punctuate this with dashes. 
if you look, if you've got that in front of you, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, dash. Let's just skip to the next dash, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We'll leave out the part that's in between the dashes. Let's read that again. Corresponding to that, to that, Noah being brought safely through the water, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, that's what the sentence is saying. That little extra bit is to explain something. He wants to clarify something. All right? So, let's see where I'm at. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, so there's the pr uh, parenthesis. I've read all of that. So here's uh, the logic of what we're trying to look at here. The waters of flood brought on death... And the waters of baptism symbolize death. How do they do that? Well, here's Romans 6, 3, which I have, uh, 3 through 5, which I have quoted for you in the notes. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. So that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. We also have a couple other passages here where Jesus described his death in terms of baptism. Mark 10, 38 and 39, Jesus said to them, do you, not know, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to uh, drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? What's he talking about? He's talking about his death. They said, this is John and James and John, we are able, they said. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink you shall drink and you shall be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. Right? You remember that James was the first one to be martyred. And John, he lasted through many years and had, had persecutions according to tradition. He experienced it too and finally died serving the Lord. But they did suffer for him. And then Luke 12, 50, he says, But I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. He's talking about his death. He's going to experience. He's going to sink down into the waters. So the waters of baptism symbolize death, all right? And we baptize. When we baptize somebody, we use this language. You use the language of death, all right? So I have somebody in the pool with me, and they have professed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I say, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then I say, buried in the likeness of what? His death. Down they go into the water. It's like they're dead. Now, I don't leave them down there because I don't want them to actually be dead. All right? And so then we raise, and then we bring them up, and I say, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Okay? And so there is this picture of death and resurrection with baptism. So just as the ark carried Noah and, the, and his family through the waters of death, so Jesus carries us through the waters of baptism. We die in him by faith, and we live in him by faith. So baptism saves us because we are in him. That's what he's saying here. And, he, we, and he, it saves us, now saves you, it says, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ that saves you, not the waters. It's what the waters re represent. Does that make sense? All right, now let's talk about the parenthetical clarification. Peter wants to make sure you understand this. Notice he has a negative uh, comment first. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh. Right, so there is a sense, some people will emphasize the idea that baptism is a cleansing. In a way, it kind of is a cleansing. Think about the old sins or... They've been washed away and so forth. And that's sort of a picture, but that's not really the main point with baptism. And it's not even the physical. It's not the physical act of baptism. If you let somebody down in the water, presumably they will be cleansed, right? You know, they'll be washed. 
He says, baptism doesn't save you by the cleansing of the flesh. It's not the physical act that saves you, but an appeal to God for a good conscience. Positively, an appeal to God for a good conscience. Now, the word appeal only occurs here in the Bible. The root has the idea of questioning. And so that's where you get this translation, an appeal. I've made an appeal to God. And so if we're going to take it that way, we could uh, talk about our faith in God. We've made an appeal. We've trusted the Lord. We've called on him for salvation. So we are buried with him in death. It's not the water that saves us, but it's that appeal. We cried to him and he saved us, you see. Now, there's another way we can uh, um, take uh, this word. The word also has the concept of a pledge. And I have a quote here from one of the commentaries. He says, apparently the word was sometimes used in a technical sense to include both a question and answer associated with the sealing of a contract. Will you pay the money when I finish this job? Yes, I'll pay the money. There's the pledge, you see? Okay. Probably the baptismal candidate in Peter's day was questioned and in response made his confession or pledge, perhaps that Jesus is Lord, thus sealing the covenant with God. That seems to be the way the word is used here. That's what he's saying, this Robert P P Picciarelli. So baptism is our positive affirmation, our pledge about what has already happened in our spirit through faith. All right, so that, does that make sense? All right, so the baptism represents death. We, and Christ, if we're in Christ, we are saved from death through the resurrection, through his resurrection. We're in him. We go down into the waters with him. We die with him. And we rise with him. If you aren't in Christ, your baptism is not going to picture anything. He's not going to carry you through the waters. You have to be in Christ. That's what baptism means. All right, so how does this antitype then connect to the theme? Remember the first point. Our confidence in the face of persecution flows from Christ's victory over sin and persecution by his resurrection. Now, he won the victory over all those Roman soldiers and the, and the uh, Jewish priests and the Sanhedrin and the enemies and his enemies in Judaism. He won the victory over all of that opposition by his resurrection. He sealed the victory, proved that he had won. Now, we are saved from death through Christ's resurrection. And so Noah pictures our victory over sin and persecution as symbolized by baptism. Our passage here is about, again, I think about victory through Christ's resurrection. That's the theme of the passage. Now, he uses some of these complicated words and obscure references, but that's really what it's all about. And so, again, the proposition as Noah was brought safely out of death, so the believer is brought safely out of the baptismal grave by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? See where we're going with that? Now, I, I, I find these pass this passage is one of, the, one of the hardest ones in the New Testament to interpret. It. And there are good people who might preach this slightly differently. So we don't want to, you know... Uh, uh, claim popehood for ourselves that we have the only true interpretation. But I think this is a good way to look at it, a reasonable way to look at it. And I've read through all the, uh, I've got about six commentaries going on this one and, uh, and summarizing what they say and working it all together, I think this seems to make sense as the best way to look at this particular one. But the big point, the big point of our passage is that the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives us confidence in the face of persecution. We have something to hold on to. We have, uh, we have a living hope. We know that even the worst thing they can do to us, the worst thing anyone can do to us, is to kill us you know, for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if they kill us, we're in heaven. So we've won, you see? And so we have a whole new look at it. We have to look at it that way and trust that the Lord, our Lord, is going to take care of us no matter what. And if it means that we die for him, then we die for him. I'm not, not looking for it. I'm not going to try, oh, please kill me. That's not the idea. But the idea is that I have the victory in Christ. And that's what we're after.
All right, well, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this time that we've had tonight. Pray for your blessing on our understanding and on our walk with you. We pray that you'll help us to faithfully follow you in all these matters as we serve you together in this place. We pray for your blessing now as we go out tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.